Good afternoon. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth presentation in the noon lecture series of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies for fall 2023. I'm Mary Gallagher. I'm a LRCCS faculty associate. Uh, the com complete series schedule is available here today and on the China Center's website. And email reminders are sent out weekly. I have just a few announcements, which I'm going to speed through. Uh, next Monday and Tuesday is our fall break, so we will not have a noon lecture series next week. Uh, the next presentation is October 24th. Andy Posovic, uh, U of M professor of art and design, who will be speaking on Bauhaus and contemporary China. On Sunday, October 18th at 12 noon, a Burton Memorial Tower performance by Tiffany Ng and Midi Ma, titled Asian and Asian American Pacific Islander Resonances. On Tuesday, October 24th, the Center for World Performance will present performance talks with Hong Kong-based artists, Jay Peng Zhang and Terry Tsang. The talks will take place at 7.30 p.m. in the Keene Auditorium of the U of M Residential College. Today's presentation will be given by Daniel Coates, research scholar and associate senior lecturer, Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. Previously, he served as an assistant professor at Academia Sinica in Taipei. Causes research focuses on political parties and East Asian politics with a particular interest in history. His first book was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, entitled Where the Party Rules, the Rank and File of China's Communist State. He is now working on a book manuscript about East Asia's other perennial ruling party, namely the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. Today, he will be speaking on disciplining business, reinventing CCP networks as tools of economic governance under Xi. Please join me in welcoming him. Yeah, good afternoon. And um, yeah, I'm just delighted to be here um, with you today. I mean, kind of someone doing Chinese studies coming to University of Michigan and Lieberthal uh, Rogel Center is a very special place here. So thank you very much, Mary, for the invitation and also for the kind introduction. So um, today I'm going to um, ask, the, ask the question. Do this? Can I go to the next slide? Here, here is my research question. So will party building transform China's economic governance? And um, there is a, sort of a very broad consensus that in China right now for the last decade or so, um, we really see a much more interventionist Chinese government. Um, and this is a consensus that I also share. But my question is whether this is just economic policies that could at the end of the day easily be reversed if the Chinese government decided to become less interventionist, or whether there are deeper structural changes that really fundamentally change how institutions uh, of economic governance work in China. Another way to put the question is there's a lot of propaganda, and uh, the question is whether we take this seriously. The propaganda says that the party and its members in companies uh, really help steering the economy, really help to kind of align company business decisions with Xi Jinping's overall policies. That at least is a propaganda, and uh, my answer to this question, just to foreshadow a little bit where this is going, is we shouldn't take the propaganda at face value, but my answer is still a resounding yes, we do see that party building does transform um, economic governance, and I'll show you evidence, and I'll try to convince you uh, why I think this is definitely the case. So my research, of course, builds on some literature, and there are several strands of literature. One is in comparative studies of political parties, so going beyond China even, just asking about the function of party members, and what this literature shows basically that in democratic systems but, and also in authoritarian systems, party members and party organizations are really important um, parts of governing uh, communities, of governing countries. And the only really big significant exception really is the United States where you don't really have party members in the way you have them in many other democracies and authoritarian systems all around the world. This is one strand of literature that this feeds into. Another is theories of institutional change. So Kathleen Thielen and um, you know, her foundational work on critical junctures and so on. Then there's uh, David Chambao um, who is working more on China and the uh, 
uh, adaptation of the Chinese Communist Party. But the third strand of literature that um, yeah, I want to show you, we go to the next slide. Um, these may be uh, works that are more familiar to people in China studies. So the first is a piece that came out about two years ago introducing the term party state. Oh, thank you. Introducing the term party state. So that's by uh, uh, Pearson, Rethmeyer, and uh, Tsai. Um, but uh, so th the idea here is that we really have to distinguish um, state capitalism and party state capitalism. So that addition of the party to the equation is really important to understand economic governance. So my work very much relates to uh, this sort of bigger idea. And then you have Tia Thornton's uh, really important work on showing that the party is advancing in society. Note that this piece was written in 2012, which is before Xi Jinping came to power. So kind of questioning a little bit whether all of this has just to do with Xi Jinping or whether there are some uh, longer term trends. And then uh, the last piece stands for actually a very small set of scholarly literature that describes the penetration tactics and uh, mobilization efforts uh, by the party in companies and also in other sectors of society. And uh, there's really very little in this last category. So this is one of the uh, few exceptional pieces that actually look how the party is building, mobilizing members in private companies. Um, so then, like, um, starting this research, I needed to decide, am I going to do quantitative work to show a party effect, sort of a nice uh, causal identification strategy to show that the presence of party members has a causal effect on business outcomes, or whether I do a qualitative approach. And so I looked at some of the existing works. And um, this is an article. There are several articles, and I'm picking just two examples of an article by Jimin Chen. And, um, uh, so this article was, is about communist party branches and their effect on labor rights. So this is a quite compelling piece that is showing in statistically um, identifiable way um, that the presence of the party has a causal effect leading to better labor practices. I mean, ask Mary, there's a lot of labor law on the books, but a lot less gets implemented. And this research basically shows that having party members, having active party members on the ground, party branches really makes a difference for enforcing some of the labor laws in practice. So whether it's uh, labor contracts or retirement or medical insurance, for instance. Another article that I want to highlight is, um, is an article. I don't know. Where do I point it? <laughs> yeah, so this is another article that looks at party effects in a very you know, robust methodological way and basically shows that party effects are particularly statistically significant in the time 2012-2017, so after Xi Jinping came to power, and what, uh, specifically what they're looking at is party activities and their effect on um, patent applications. So there is some quantitative research done there, and um, there are some endogeneity issues that I don't want to go in, into here, and the causal identification strategy seems to be, you know, given what we have in terms of data, uh, not bad at all. Uh, but I'm left really wondering here what the causal mechanisms are. How exactly party building is done so effectively? How exactly the party presence uh, changes anything at all, and also how the party expands and chooses to expand in some companies and not in others. And if we want to talk about indigeneity and control variables and so on, we really need to have a better understanding of how the party uh, goes into companies to begin with. So I see my contribution uh, really as, as one of uh, not, you know, working on this quantitative side for now, but in this case, looking at uh, qualitative evidence to understand how the party expands its presence how could party building plausibly influence business decisions? So I really want to look at the micro mechanisms, the causal chain, the causal mechanisms, and I want to use uh, qualitative evidence to really figure out how these things um, you know, could work out in practice because uh, we have these kind of causal findings, but we have a much, much less of an understanding of how actually party building um, has the effects that statistically are significant, but we don't quite know how the effects come about. So um, what I'm doing, this is my methodology here. So I'm basically reading a lot of documents on party building. So on the left-hand side, you have um, party building research, the Nate Sun, so the reference material, um, which is really part of an um, entire epistemic community writing about party building. You have uh, institutes for Marxism studies at many universities. They are working on party building and organi organizing the Chinese Communist Party. 
um, and you have uh, journals and uh, different publications that are related to the organization department of the Communist Party. And when you actually start looking, it's kind of overwhelming how much material I actually had to work with. I was kind of surprised just how much of these, how many of these things are really put uh, into writing and you can kind of just read about how the party goes about it. Um, and so that really helps then to figure out the causal mechanisms. On the right hand side, you see a document that's related to inspections. I'll talk about this a little later. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. But uh, inspection reports are really also very important. Discipline inspections reports are extremely important to understand where the party sees sort of interventions um, in companies that are most uh, helpful to advance the presence of the party. So, um, this was my introduction in terms of the question, the literature, and my methods. And now I want to present my findings in three distinct uh, blocks. So um, the findings that come out of this uh, qualitative approach, basically just reading a lot of documents. Um, and uh, sort of the first set of findings here, I have the heading um, institutional bricolage. And what I mean by this is that there's a very particular way that institutional change happens, that the party adapts and the dynamics uh, in which uh, the party adapts to new challenges. And I'm particularly interested what triggers innovation in the party. The party adapts, but what exactly is it that makes party organizers sort of aware that they need to change something? And what are the kind of solutions that come to their mind. And I want to give you two contrasting images. And I would be really interested if we can do a show of hands later, uh, if you compare the two images, which one you think uh, represents, you know, gives you confidence if you were the organization department, that there really is a powerful presence of the party in the firm. I'm going to show these images and then I'm going to ask you that question, which one is the one that really shows the powerful presence. And there's no wrong answer. So um, I'm really curious to, to so this, is, uh, this image shows basically, um, this is from an interior design company that is offering um, you know, um, to build party meeting rooms. And uh, so this is their design proposal and it is implemented in, uh, in a really existing company and I like the ceiling light and all that. So the party sort of illuminating the party meeting discussion. So there's uh, going to be party meetings once a week. So this is my image number one. How much of a party presence, powerful, how powerful is a party in this company? And now the contrasting image is this. So uh, this is a company in Jiangsu. They're working on uh, property rights and they post some images of their weekly party meetings, uh, which uh, look a little different from the image before. And I just want to have a show of hands, sort of uh, your intuition. And there's no wrong answer, really not. Um, so, who thinks the first image is really shows a more powerful presence of the party? So, two people. Uh, no, you just took water, so just one person. Okay, so who thinks that the second image is the most po more powerful one? A few more people. That's, that's very interesting. So there's like a clear majority for the second image. But it's interesting that both images are, of course, used by the companies to demonstrate the prowess of the party. So in a way, you know, there are different strategies to convince party organizers that there's some real change happening. And both images are used by company to make this point. And it's just different strategies. Um, and uh, so the first one, I mean, kind of as an argument to this is, at least this demonstrates that the company, the party was able to secure some real funding and space and sort of it shows the discipline of the new era, perhaps more. I mean, here you have a tea set. I was told by people that if discipline inspectors are coming in, you need to put away your tea sets. It's just not very, uh, you know, this is not a working atmosphere. Don't show your tea sets. But um, on the other hand, the second is kind of a cozy setting, but it's not an empty room and it's real people, there's some intimacy and it's sort of an unintrusive presence perhaps in the company, but at the same time, that's exactly what you need perhaps to get things done in a way uh, that's not alienating the company leadership. So um, uh, the, the bigger point I want to make, I mean, one is just to give you an intuition what the party presence in company looked like. The other point I want to make is that really when you read through these documents, you see that the party is, uh, there's a big trade-off between kind of old ways, uh, like uh, work, uh, building something from the existing structures and building something new. 
So the party never really starts from scratch. More often than not, you have a party uh, cell already set up, and so if you do party building, you start with you know, what you have. You don't start from scratch. And that also means that you are actually taking very old routines that the party has been using you know, from its foundation. 100 years ago, 70 years ago, there are some routines that are just uh, sacrosanct. I mean, they're sacred routines that the party isn't changing. They're on the books in the party constitution. And you really, as an organization department, have to have um, these things in place. I'm going to give you an example just in a minute for, for these old routines that, that just can't go away. But you are deploying them to very different ends. So you're going to have to change them. And you have these inherited organizations with a 100-year uh, history. And they have achieved the revolution, so they seem like they have shown that they're capable of even overthrowing government. So they should be, you know, in, in principle, you can perhaps reinvent them in a way to meet new challenges, uh, even in the economic realm. At least that is the theory. So um, what I see then in, in many of these um, documents is, and I try to find a term for this, so I use institutional bricolage, and this is my definition. I've thought about this for so many weeks. I need to show this to you. So, it's, um, so if the organization department's organizers come around and do party building, um, they're remodeling the organization, but they do it very deliberately. There's a lot of deliberation, which is why I can see it on the books. There's a lot written about it. There's a lot of scholarship even about this. We wouldn't usually read it because it's bone dry and it's a really an acquired taste if you read this kind of thing. It's um, less secrecy than just really a jargon that, um, that people don't want to read it, that this is not very well known even in China perhaps, but you see a very deliberate and piecemeal continuous activity of remodeling. So it's not that, that you know, Xi Jinping comes around and there's kind of a, a sudden outburst of activity. It's always been, it has been going on for a while. The organization department is always there and there's always, uh, there's always a department that is thinking about upgrading the party. It's become much more visible and there's a more, a more impetus with Xi Jinping, but it's really a gradual activity. And you have so many devices sort of from old times that are sometimes really very incompatible um, from earlier eras of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, but then you also come up with new ways of running the party. And you will see hopefully in the course of this presentation some of the examples how the old and the new is kind of merged in interesting ways. Uh, one example I will get to right now. So one rule that's on the books for a really long time um, so from the beginning of the party, basically, is that when there are three party members in a Dunway, in a room, they basically have to form a party cell. So um, three or more party members, you really need to form a party cell. That's something from the revolutionary era. So when, you know, when the party was the underdog and you had to kind of this um, you know, secret organization, three people, you need a party cell. And now, so um, on the internet, people uh, are making jokes about three astronauts in space, and they are definitely all three party members. So are they going to set up a party cell in space? They should, right, because of that rule. So that's, that's of course, a joke. I'm not sure they've set up a party cell in space. I wouldn't claim that. Um, but um, what, I, what I will um, show you, and there's going to be examples for this too, is um, there has been the, the drive to set up party cells in private companies, for instance, has far less to do with sort of one big um, you know, political uh, scheme at the top, but it's really bureaucratic routine. And we see this uh, starting really in 2000. So these are data just from Shandong province. It shows uh, the share of private companies that do not have a party, um, any kind of uh, affiliation to a party organization. In, uh, you know, shortly after 2000, 2002 is the earliest data point I have, about 90% of private companies in Shandong did not have a party um, affiliation. And um, you can really, I mean, you can go back to the record, and it's really interesting how the organization department uh, went in very routine ways, like just uh, f uh, thinking that this is not a good idea. We have this rule on the book, three people needs to be a party cell, and they started building up party cells and party committees in private companies starting about in the year, year 2002, very gradually, very, method uh, met uh, very systematically. And uh, Huawei, coincidentally, is, the, is supposed to be the first private firm that has a fully-fledged party committee. That's at least, you know, the scholarship in China, that's what is claimed. And that would have been just 2001, 2002. 
And this was not a big political decision at all. This was a very local decision of uh, the local party organization department uh, talking to Huawei officials and saying, well, you have this outside party say, we need to have this just following the bureaucratic routine and it's not going to change anything. And we have no big scheme here. You just need to set up your party cell because you know, of this rule, this is on the book. And a similar reason like for setting up party cells abroad, for instance, um, is also, I mean, if you have three party members working in a company abroad, I mean, in principle, you do need to set up a party cell as well. That's why we have seen the proliferation of party cells abroad. Again, it's not coming out of some big scheme of, uh, you know, ruling the world or anything like that, but it's, I see a lot of bureaucratic routine why these party cells were set up long before anyone was thinking about how do you actually use them. Also in private companies, when you read the documents at the time, there was no idea in 2002 how these things would ever be used and deployed to any practical ends. It was basically just implementing a bureaucratic routine, a requirement that was on the book and that had to be done. But when Xi Jinping then came to power, he could sort of start and on the base of this structure that was set up before him and sort of could have a much more ambitious um, agenda and sort of be much more ambitious about what to do actually with, uh, with these parties. So the agenda came later. First was a bureaucratic routine and then came the agenda. Um, I'm probably going to skip this, that we can have a little bit of Q&A. It's just joint party cells. This is another in, uh, invention that you don't have one party cell for every company, but that you have party cells that are encompassing several companies. That's been a big uh, innovation that's um, inherited actually from the revolutionary era then had been phased out for a long time and then came back uh, under Xi Jinping really in um, big time. But it's really something that existed prior to um, the, uh, the communist takeover. Um, this was a standard practice that was um, invented and brought back later on. Um, also kind of the mismatch or kind of how digital tools are also uh, deployed to really conservative ends. I mean, this is uh, one app that is used uh, in managing the party. So this is from a website that is selling this program to run your party cell. And what's really striking here, I mean, one thing is the technological capability that you sort of uh, can trace in real time where party members are in this particular location. So um, that's sort of interesting that you can do this with, uh, you know, cell phone data and so on. Um, but also what strikes me when I look at this app and how it's done, I mean, you have a lot of detail on this website. It's really just digitizing things that were done offline. For the most part, it's just the same kind of metrics and the same kind of procedures that were once done offline is now put into digital form. So it's kind of interesting how we deploy these digital tools to basically give a second life to these time-worn, but also test, tried and tested methods of running the party. So it's a very interesting amalgamation of old and, and new. Um, so this is sort of my first set of findings that sort of gives you an idea of how the dynamic of party men, you know, what triggers innovation. Um, and now my, the second um, set of findings, I was really actually, when, um, when I did this research, I was really surprised um, you know, how much I could find on this question, how the party or the organization department would enforce change among businesses. I thought this would be the most difficult part of, of my research but it's, it's really actually very explicitly written down how you achieve uh, penetration in companies. And the first thing to notice, and I have a slide for this, is it can be very um, harmonious in a way. I mean, many businesses um, are eager to maintain cordial relationships uh, with a state, so more often than not, it just takes some nudging and the businesses would set up party cells. So this particular image, uh, so here you see the Ambassador Sun in Kenya, and she's inviting companies, Chinese invested companies in Kenya, um, to talk about party building. Um, and so I think 30 something, 35 companies followed her invitation. And you see right here in front, uh, Standard Bank. So I thought this is a South African bank, but it turns out there's Chinese investment in this bank. And so it's part of this, um, you know, it's part of the agenda, so sort of, it's included in the agenda for party building um, abroad. I mean, just because, you know, there's a connection to China, you have Chinese employees, again, the rule of more than three party members uh, sort of puts that company also on the agenda. And this, you know, as far as I can tell, is not conflictual at all. There's some nudging, some uh, invitation, and then you see some party building actually um, taking off and companies advertising on their website what they're doing in terms of party building. But nudging is not always enough. 
And um, so there are case studies, um, there's in one province, there was a case study of banks that needed to establish a certain procedure so that decisions before they go to the board meeting, they have to go through the party committee. So any major decision before it goes to the board has to go to a party committee within the bank. That was the idea. And the majority of banks were just okay with it, but there are a few that were pushing back. So not everyone agreed. And that became really interesting and the organization department then made a case study out of this, um, how then eventually you also put enough pressure on these companies to comply with the rules. And in a nutshell, I mean, the way to gain leverage is basically, I mean, first you talk to them, and then you talk uh, some more to them, and then you, uh, then you just talk about sanctions. And at the end sort of, uh, uh, of the escalation, and it's like written um, as sort of, standard operating procedure, if nothing else works, you basically um, deny business licenses or business permits. And that's the end of the story. I mean, then either the company ends or the company ultimately agrees to uh, set up um, this new party arrangement, this uh, uh, new process. So there is some real leverage there. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, this is um, sort of, you can achieve some big things, but the party is actually what um, micromanaging much more party building. And what is, what uh, came out as really by far the most important tool for enforcing uh, party building is discipline inspections. And now discipline inspections, perhaps a popular image, perhaps not in this room, but the popular image of discipline inspections under Xi would probably be something like this, very misleading, but I'm showing them anyway because that may be, you know, the impression you're going after corrupt officials, you send in like the discipline inspectors, you find cash in the refrigerator, lots of cash, and um, I mean, that's sort of, yeah, you can make TV series from this, and this is discipline inspections. But when you actually, and actually in like between 2012 and 2017, yeah, I would say this was mainly what discipline inspections were about. But after the 19th Party Congress, things really changed a lot. And discipline inspections, if you look at the party constitutions, of course, are a lot more than just corruption. And basically, in um, establishing party discipline is a whole list of things to make sure the party is powerfully represented on the ground and the prerogatives of the party are, um, are followed in firms, in companies, uh, all throughout society. So it's a very different, much broader mandate than you know, this image suggests. And so when discipline inspectors come in, it's a scary moment. So this is ICBC, the world's biggest bank, six trillion dollars, I just need to say this every time, just, you know, it makes it look like such a big and powerful institution, but here the bankers are a little scared because they have a discipline inspection committee coming in, and um, I mean, this is a really dangerous moment for many of them, I mean, the corruption can lead to really, um, you know, to, to punishment, I mean, there are bankers all the time who are found to be corrupt, and there's even executions of bankers, so it's a, you know, to some of the people here, this is a life and death issue, um, but also at this, so when discipline inspectors come in, so let's say there's a mobilization meeting, uh, discipline inspectors will first tell you what are we here for, what is our mission, what do we want to achieve, what, are our, uh, what is our focus, which, what do we want to see while we are here. But there's also, they ask the bankers to uh, denounce each other. Like, uh, come forth, like there's a mailbox, there's an email address, there's a phone number, tell us a little bit about some things that are not right in this company. And that doesn't include just corruption, but it's also about party building and, you know, are party um, sales meeting properly? Is party building taken seriously? Are there pe uh, people who are kind of not really doing the um, um, criti uh, critique and self-critique and so on? So you have a mailbox for this. So there's some denunciation. So this is a very, very tense atmosphere. Um, I've worked in German government for a little bit, so I'm used to inspections going away after a week. Not in China, they stay for a really long time, two months at least, normally in banks. So it's a little like work teams from the old uh, times. So they stay, um, they come in, they inspect a lot of papers, they also really stay for a long time, so they see a lot of things uh, in the company. Then they write a report at the end of their, uh, their stay. And very importantly for my research, the company then has to uh, write back about very specific changes they did in response um, to, these, uh, to this report. So these are verifiable things, often quantitative measures, things that actually if you, you know, come back to the company, this could be checked. 
and discipline inspectors are coming back sometimes and do a secondary inspection and do check up of what was written, whether what's written on the report actually was implemented. And so for my research, this is very, very useful because it says like in detail what kind of changes had to be made in response to the discipline inspectors um, coming in. So um, for me, like the finding here is like there are these kind of very crude ways of putting a pressure on companies to adopt some measures. But the discipline inspectors are really the ones who are micromanaging. Very long reports, very long to-do lists of what exactly needs to change uh, for the party to have a greater presence on the ground. So what are the effects of um, more party presence? How can you tell? What are the kinds of things that the inspectors want? Um, and what can we see? So, the first thing is, so this is kind of my third set of findings. So what are actually changes that we can see? Um, so this is first of all, I mean, I need to kind of start with a, with a vision. The vision is um, that, um, so the overall idea is that you have ordinary party members down, you know, both in the, on the board, but also down to the factory floor in banks, you know, local branches of banks, who are adopting their own business making business decisions to like the big picture policy brought out by Xi Jinping. So you have regulation, you have of course state ownership in many banks, and you have all these hierarchies that are enforcing uh, policies from the center. But party building is sort of jumping across these hierarchical layers and sort of every party member is directly responsible to the big policies. In this case, you know, this website is talking about important pronouncements by Xi Jinping that are relevant to work in the finance sector. And as an ordinary party member in a bank, you're supposed to study these and then in your business decision, uh, take those on board. And um, how do you show this? I mean, first of all, there's a lot of performance of loyalty. This is again, you know, the world's biggest bank. We had it before. You have, um, you have the top leadership of the bank coming out uh, to an exhibition to celebrate the 100th anniversary. And of course, you could say it's a sort of cheap talk. I mean, first of all, it's not cheap because companies have to give 1% of the personnel budget to the party. So you have 2% to the trade union and you have 1% to the party. So that's a lot of money. But it's also, I, when I talk to business people, they say the money, ah, it's like a tax, it's okay. But it's really the time and sort of the distraction from our main core business that's much more costly in terms of the time invested for party meetings, for party activities, even for inspections, I mean, this is not trivial. This is just a lot of um, time that's, that's going away. So in Shandong, which is a province where I did a lot of research, unfortunately, I wasn't part, uh, at this event, but there's really spectacular, extravagant performances of party loyalty. This was for the 100th anniversary, so you had an entire sing and dance opera, um, like showing the loyalty to the party, reenacting the history of the party, and uh, so this is towards the end of the show. You also had a sing-along party oath, which I just don't know how it worked. I would have liked to be in the room. Um, but so this towards the end, you see the sunflowers, familiar sight from the Cultural Revolution. And you also have the leadership of the bank, actually twice in the image, one in person, and one there's this uh, you know, meeting of leadership of the bank studying um, uh, party history. So this shows like we are really loyal to this, um, you know, to the party and we really s acknowledge and recognize the leadership of the party. And uh, so this discourse, I mean, to what extent does it then change, you know, when in a board meeting? I mean, I don't, I, you know, I'm not in a board meeting, so I don't know, but I mean, these kind of pronouncements, are, you know, if you're caught not sticking to this language, that could be a problem when the investi uh, uh, investigation, discipline inspection investigation comes in. And uh, so if there's any kind of competition and someone wants your post, probably I would say, you know, you, are, you should be on the safe side. But that's a little bit speculative here, so I don't know. I mean, I know there's this uh, outside performance that's taking a lot of time, taking a lot of money. Um, whether it influences business decisions, we need to do a little more research there. Um, I'm skipping this. Uh, also in terms of procedures. 
you just have, I mean, I already mentioned there is this, uh, you have a party committee that needs to deliberate before anything goes to the board, so that is adopted very broadly, and sort of the realm of decisions where the party wants to be involved has sort of grown over the last five years to involve a lot of personnel decisions, for instance. There also is something called the party work department, and I heard so many jokes about them. It's like a way station to retirement. Oh, you know, if someone doesn't perform well as a banker, you put him in the party committee. That discourse had cha has changed quite a lot. So I talked to bankers uh, recently and they well, no, no, these, this is different. Like at the time, it's true, you put people there. Now you put people who actually have a future in the bank and sort of it's a very different thing from before. And I am not so surprised because in discipline inspection reports, the quality of the people on this party committee is part of the inspection and you can't just put cadres on their way to retirement into this. This has to be um, people who are doing real work and are really participating in business decisions. The other procedural change that I find really important is setting up party building incentives. So we are all familiar, I mean, probably in this room, everyone is familiar that part officials in China, bureaucrats, they have performance evaluation and criteria for promotion, like GDP is important and so on. And in banks now, in order to be promoted, you also have your target on party building. What exactly this is, I can also see because different people highlight different things. So how many meetings you had, how many party uh, study history le lessons you had. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to show that you actually have done something in terms of party building. Um, and, uh, but it's also important, uh, like metrics, like how many people in the top leadership of the bank uh, also in the top leadership of the party inside the bank. So the party committee of the bank and the leadership of the bank, how much of an overlap is there? And there should be more and more of an overlap, but it's not yet perfect. And that makes it really interesting when you talk to bankers who are not party members and who are on the board, which I did, on the board of a bank, but not part of the party committee. So that creates a really difficult situation because you never quite know what was deliberated in the party committee and then you have this board meeting and you're sort of a little bit as a loss what was decided at the party committee right, right before. So, um, so that seems quite significant. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to like, um, so different banks are showing off like different areas of their engagement um, you know, for goals of the party. So this is Shanghai Rural Commercial Bank and it's always emphasizing in its report, in its annual report, that you need to grasp the hot topics um, of current affairs. So serving rural revitalization, the bank had gone much more into urban banking. I mean, rural uh, areas, poverty elevation is far from the core mission where the bank had been making profits in recent years. And the bank now is going back to sort of its origin because it was, after all, a rural commercial bank. So it sort of needs to go back to its origin and is much more active in agriculture. And we can see this over the reports over time, agriculture coming back much more centrally. And it's um, like explicitly said that this is um, taking into account political goals and the hot topics of current affairs. That's usually the formulation. Um, but you also have very quantifiable, and I'm going through the different reports, and I'm just listing for you a few of the really operational benchmarks that uh, discipline inspection teams would look at. So the ratio of manufacturing loans in to total portfolio. So these are things that a bank can be held accountable for. If you don't have enough manufacturing loans, you can be accused of violating party discipline. So you don't, you know, it's not a business issue, but it's a political issue, and the discipline inspectors will come and say, your manufacturing um, loans are too few, or too few loans to small companies. A lack of an agricultural portfolio is a big one. Interestingly, too many loans to local governments is not politically desirable. So you can be, um, you know, you can get into trouble for that, and because many banks have so many local government loans on their books, that is, of course, a big thing, and that would create a, a big change then don't finance land transaction fees for real estate developers. So that's sort of overheated real estate sector. And here you see the party sort of the, taking a measure to, you know, just one little thing, land trans, well, little thing, land transaction fees are huge, um, huge things. So um, just taking this away uh, would, of course, um, yeah, take a lot out of the heat out of the real estate sector. And, I mean, what do we see today? I'm not going to talk about real estate, but it does look like that policy had some sort of an effect on cooling down the real estate sector. But 
these would be the kind of things, if I were to do quantitative analysis now, I would start with this list because these are the recurrent themes, at least in banking, that come up. And sort of there's a very clear mechanism how these things would then translate into um, business decisions. Yeah, so I just want to conclude, and I really hope that some of you can stay for Q&A because I would really like to hear, you know, sort of your reflections on this. Um, but let me just conclude briefly. So m the word that, that I use to um, talk about the, am I, uh, the uh, combination of repurposing these tried and tested tools of the past and somehow deploy them to much more contemporary ends. I call this institutional bricolage. I mean, that's really the, um, at the gist of the institutional dynamics of party building. You have discipline inspections as really the one institution to look at or the one mechanism to look at uh, to enforce party building and achieve better party building in companies, in banks, but also beyond. Mm. And then there is a lot of transformation underway. I mean, the discourse is apparent. Um, decision procedures, it's apparent that they're changing. Where the business priorities then really change, I mean, that you would need to do run regressions and do a quantitative analysis to what extent you know, these business decisions, these business priorities really change as a result of the party building or is it just as a result of overall policies, just top-down enforcement and state-owned companies? I mean, there would be some empirical work that needed to be done there. But my goal in this was basically to point out the causal mechanisms and sort of what is behind that causal chain that, that could um, uh, that leads from party building to uh, different business decisions. And that could explain some of the quantitative results that have already come out in terms of the party effect in business decisions. Yeah, so thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Yes, please. should repeat the question here. So there are two, if I render the question correctly, there are of course different par uh, kinds of inspections and these discipline inspections are just a subset of all the inspections that are happening in China today. Um, and I mean, they're just normal government inspections as you see them in any bureaucracy. And um, I would emphasize that the discipline inspections are really a, a, a different, qualitatively different thing. I mean, it's sort of the empowerment, I and mean, they are party, they are not government, so that's just formally a big difference. So they have kind of access to the party leadership, you know, top level party leadership. Also, if you see the composition of many of these inspection teams, I mean, these are sometimes, you know, retired officials that had a lot of clout and still have a lot of clout in the provincial government. You also have specialists, but usually it's a mix of specialists who really understand sort of the details of the financial details and know what to look for in these banks. And you also have uh, people with a lot of political clout, leaders, former leaders, retired leaders um, from a provincial government who really um, have sort of big influence in the top leadership of the province. So these are very powerful organizations. And as far as I know, the other inspectors, I don't know about the ones you met, but they don't usually stay for two months. It's, that's sort of a different, um, yeah, different depth of investigation as well. Yes. Um, hi, Daniel, thank you for like all those details and the presentation. I have like a follow-up question to, to that one. It's sort of what are the things that you see, because like a disciplined business is kind of like a classic topic in sort of the history of developmentalist state authoritarian context in East Asia in particular. And so I'm wondering, and it sounds like this this project you're working on is more like to discipline for the sake of increasing party power than some kind of pursuing some kind of economic performance. So I wonder if you can sort of speak a, a little bit more on that. 
Yeah, I think this really goes to the heart of the difference between, um, because we have, uh, remember at the beginning, we, I, yeah, do I go back all, yeah. So we, it's not so many slides, I'm gonna be there. I think this, go, um, this goes to the distinction also between party state capitalism and state capitalism. I mean, if you look at some of the uh, economic governance, that, let's say in Japan or Taiwan or Korea, of course you have a lot of state intervention. It's sort of market oriented, but you also really do a lot, have a lot of heavy handed state intervention and corruption was always a problem. I mean, as soon as you have a government picking the winners, um, especially in South Korea, that was a huge problem with the Chebol and the, and the government. So you needed uh, ways to sort of uh, drive out corruption. That was very high. And if you weren't able to drive out corruption, that really undermined some of the success of these developmental states. So um, discipline inspection in terms of rooting out corruption, creating a clean bureaucracy, you find this really, as you say, everywhere in, in East Asia. But then discipline inspectors who are politicizing businesses to the extent also that you have a party instructions like that um, people in companies, so these are not bureaucrats. So normally the inspections are disciplining bureaucrats not to take money. Here you have discipline inspections that go to business people working in companies. They are party members, but their main job and what they are paid for, then the payroll of companies, and they are disciplined in a very different way, not to take money, because they are not calling the shots in terms of subsidies, who to give subsidies. So that's, uh, it's a very different problem from having a state official in, uh, in the MITI in Japan, um, perhaps being dined and wined by Toyota, and then like seeing subsidies or regulation that's in the favor of one company, uh, compared to someone who is working in a company and is then subject to discipline inspection um, and basically asking whether he is following some very ambiguous overall policy given handed out by Xi Jinping, which keeps you on your toes and thinking how you fulfill this mandate. And the mandate also isn't very clear. So it also uh, lets people wonder, like, what exactly do we have to do that we fulfill the standards of the discipline inspectors? So there are big differences um, to the inspections we saw in, in Japan or South Korea or even Taiwan. Um, yes. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I know the title of your talk is called Discipline Business. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the business actually benefit anything from this process. And also, I'm curious to know if like, this discipline business actually pr like, playing a very uh, good role in when, the economy, when the economy is experiencing uh, uptick um, growth, but when the economy is experiencing a downturn, do you think the party will try to leave the business alone or they're trying to play a more active role in promoting business using those type kind of organizational structure? Yeah, so for now, the conviction, uh, at least uh, Xi Jinping, what comes out is that um, politicizing business, making business more responsive to Xi Jinping's instructions, can only be good for solving all the ills that befall the Chinese economy. You can solve all the problems with this uh, party building approach. I mean, economists would say, wait a minute, are these things market oriented? They're the opposite of market oriented. And if you look at other, you know, even the Chinese model of development, um, you know, up until 2012, is a lot more market oriented than the ideal that is pursued in this. So there would be a lot of skepticism, of course, by, by economists, especially in the West, but even in China, um, whether this is something that's good for the, for the business. If you ask business people, you get very pragmatic answers. Oh, it's good for business because it's good for subsidies. And I have one case of a business who said it was great. Like, we did do this party building, it costs some money, we have to spend a lot of money on this, but we were not export oriented before this. And then because of this party building, we got access to the, um, it's, I forgot what country, but it's a European country, the, the consulate, the Chinese embassy in some Netherlands, perhaps European country, and that contact and that relationship then really helped to transform our business and become much more outgoing and export oriented. So these are the success stories. Where then comp and these are, of course, then also highlighted in reports by the party that say, and they have beautiful metaphors, like party building, and um, it's like, the t uh, 
can I do this? Like the, the uh, kind of our profit making is kind of a bird and it needs two wings. One is looking for profit and making reasonable profit um, calculation. The other is party building. And uh, if you do both, you know, you have a grand uh, future for your party. And then there are these success cases where basically a good relation to the uh, government pays off. But overall, I mean, it's not market-oriented. So you wonder to what extent this is also just really, really um, expensive. And um, I mean, there's a reason why not every company goes through the embassy, because it would be an extraordinary bu bureaucratic um, um, uh, apparatus if every con uh, company just went through an embassy to market its product. So um, it seems that there's still a conviction at the very top that this is helpful. Um, but I have a hard time to imagine that this is really like from a profit. Oh, can I say one more thing? What I found really interesting in the inspection reports is that you shouldn't overemphasize prof profit making. So some would have an even more fundamental answer to your question. That is, oh, you shouldn't ask about profit making. It's enough if we sort of break even. And uh, be, because we need to be sustainable, we need to have more equality, we have to have all these other things. So asking whether it's profits is, the wrong question. We need to be sustainable, and if, if all of this costs us some money and you know, reduces profits, we are happy because it's good for the future of uh, the long term future of our country. So, this is the right thing to do. So, that would be a different answer that you like, perhaps more in the spirit of um, you know, the discipline inspections. I know there are a couple of questions on Zoom. So, um, I think before we get to Zoom, I just have, I have two questions. One question is about the, I looked up the paper that you showed, the, the Chun, uh, Jiming Chun's paper. Mm -hmm. So and there's lots of earlier papers that also try to demonstrate a relationship between either having a trade union or having a party, mm -hmm. uh, a communist party, with better labor outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I, I really question the relationship partly because of a selection effect in the sense that, so my question is how are firms, particularly private firms, chosen for um, party construction? And whether or not it's possible that the, the firms that are, are chosen for party construction are already better firms. I mean, maybe there's a slight impact in the sense when the party gets there, they do, they improve it even more so. But, um, the, okay, so that's one question, just about how are, par how are, how are firms mm -hmm. selected for party construction, if, if you have any sense, and if it's different than previously under C. My second question is a very s cynical one. Um, because I've done a lot of research over the years in terms of what firms think about having a trade union and sometimes also having a party, um, a party cell in the firm. And I have rarely, if ever, met an entrepreneur who wanted one because they feel like they interfere in market decisions, particularly you know, trade union, but even maybe even more so party. And so I would think that there are still lots of reasons for why private entrepreneurs would not want a party. And yet I've seen in a lot of the, um, your examples, but also in other research, there's this sea change in opinion where people are suddenly talking about the positive effects of the party. So my question is, is everyone just lying? Oh, I love these questions. So the firm, um, the selection bias, I mean, this is part of why I decided not, I, I think in terms of, I mean, especially the Chun paper, I thought, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, evidentiary standards of political science, like doing this uh, um, um, discontinuity design, like if you have three party members, it's sort of a little bit random when you are at the cutoff point, but the cutoff point means that you have a party branch, if you have a party branch, like it's, a, so I think as far as causal identification goes, this is pretty um, advanced. Uh, uh, so um, I think uh, in terms of solving the endogeneity problem, but I do have this question about, if we want to really solve the endogeneity problem, we have to understand firm selection. And perhaps even having more than three party members is not random. I did come across, for instance, um, um, like organization department picking firms that have only two and sending, like really telling the firm you need to hire one more party member so you are complete. Uh, and you have a you know, three-member party. So there is even selection there. And so that's part of why I want to do this research before jumping to some new causal identification, because I know there's been so much written on this. I really want to understand how firms are mm, selected. 
And, um, and I think there is, like, it's, size is a big one. So I think there's, like, a number of variables that I would need to take into account. Size is a big one, particular sectors, so sort of the sectors that are politically on the agenda right now are selected. And um, how you could get at this quantitatively is to look at the different discipline inspections where they actually send. Because some companies receive, like, two or three in the last 10 years. Um, some just didn't receive any. And sort of looking at different sectors, so the health sector gets a lot of inspections. The banking sector is sort of medium. And there are some other sectors that never ever get any inspections. So that would tell me, so there is, like, we need to take into account what is the, party, the, the focus of party building. And that's part of the reason for this project, to figure. And then, you know, I think only when we understand the indigeneity really clearly how these firms, we can go on to theorize um, what then the effect of the party is. Uh, the parallel to the trade union, I think, is, is absolutely right. But it's really strange. So what I hear, and, and so what's written and what I hear is sort of exactly the opposite. So, uh, so when you, I don't know, I'm talking about party sets. So when I started my research on my first book, I was talking also about, you know, to managers and to businesses, and they all said, oh, we can't handle party sets. They don't do anything. They just watch some movies, they go on tours, they do tourism. It's really no big deal, they watch some movies. So it's not like the trade union, we can handle this. Just let, let's have the party sets. And there's some good outcome because it gives us some in with the government. And when we are in some kind of trouble, like having a party set, it just has advantages. And um, so that has changed a lot. And there's a bifurcation, and I think there is mis strategic misrepresentation going on between, on the one hand, people saying, oh, there's all these profits, and then in private conversations saying, no, this is really very intrusive. This is not like before when they were watching movies. Now we are at a different time. And that's partly what, why I think this research, I mean, there's only one right answer. I feel sort of I know where it's going. But from our interviews, I just feel that business people see that party sales really are intrusive. The question is whether there's any chance to not have. So it's kind of a very, when I ask, so do you choose as a hypothetical question? Because we have to. I mean, there's no way out. So we kind of have to manage and cope with whatever we get. So uh, why are you asking this hypothetical? So. so I have a couple of questions from the virtual audience. Are party sales established in joint ventures with foreign participation? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, but but I, 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 want, I don't want to be so, I mean, this is unfriendly. So let me, so no, if you actually look at, um, I showed you a statistics on the um, private firms, um, like more penetration by party sales in private firms. And if you look at the statistics over time, actually, Private firms were behind joint ventures. So joint ventures came first getting party sales. They were actually the front runners because there was an idea that we need to kind of understand more how these joint ventures work. So they were in, uh, sort of the focus of party building even before it was going, um, going into private firms more broadly. So joint ventures are a little bit ahead of the curve in getting party sales, at least historically. And this is another question. What sorts of sanctions or penalties occur for not following instructions or recommendations in a party discipline inspection report? Yeah, so there are two kinds of uh, uh, sanctions. One that is often talked about is um, just in terms of the subsidies or, you know, all the way to business licenses because of sanctions that are going against the company. But I think much more powerful is sort of the sanctions or the... Um, um, both, it, it's sort of also incentives, positive incentives and negative incentives that are targeted to individuals, so in terms of promotion and so on. And my sense is that those individual sanctions are much more powerful in changing people's actual behavior. There's a company, I mean, it's a company, but it doesn't hit you personally, whereas like this, per if you are personally responsible. I'll give you an example. So in banks, for instance, um, there are party um, so bank branches, these are very small things. So in Shanghai, a small bank branch, perhaps uh, 10 people working there, perhaps three party members, and they are evaluated in terms of party building. And so the, uh, whoever happens to be the party secretary of this three party party cell in this, this branch will have to answer questions if that branch is somehow not following on these indicators. So it becomes very personal and maybe a problem, you know, in terms of promotion and so on. And so these sanctions are 
uh, much less grandiose perhaps than revoking a business license, but at the same time, they're very micro-targeted and um, similar to the incentives that bureaucrats have in performing on GDP and so on. Um, my sense is, but I don't have a very good proof, but my sense would be that those are the mo more effective ones um, compared to the sanctions that hit the entire firm. Do the uh, party committees within the uh, business have any role in instigating a discipline inspection? Hmm, not that I know. No, I haven't come across this. Would be interesting. I mean, officially speaking, the inspection is ad hoc and no one should be informed about it ahead of time. I doubt this is true. I think there are some indications. And I mean, I, even I can tell when an inspection is going to happen because there is some logic to it. I mean, you have sort of a round of banking inspections. And if you see that ICB is getting inspected and you are the Agriculture Bank of China, I mean, just wait two days and you will have your inspection um, coming in. But it also, um, the decision to pick certain sectors for inspection is taken at a very high level, so it would need to, but I mean, ICBC, the CEO, he's a powerful person, so I can imagine that he has his ways. I cannot prove it, though. Mm -hmm. I would uh, expect that that's It seems like being a party member uh, in an organization, and you're paid by that organization, you'd have divided loyalties in some situations. Um, definitely. And you are wearing two hats and pr uh, probably even if you're the same person sitting in the board meeting or sitting in the party committee, you have different priorities and uh, I don't know how you're going to handle like the two hats. But I mean, that's something that's true not only in this situation and that's kind of in a party. If you think of a party member, I mean, even going back to, I don't know, great deep forward and you are a party um, member or even cadre in a village. I mean, you have very different, you have loyalty to your village, but you also have loyalty to the cause of communism. So how exactly are you handling that conflict? And, you know, to what extent is that just top-down instructions that you don't have a choice? And to what extent are you using your own discretion to either do a little bit more for your uh, community versus for the outside? That's definitely the conflict. And, um, and that sort of makes party, um, the party member as an institution so interesting because it's not just state officials who are kind of sitting in their offices and uh, have no connection to the community, but they are in a, embedded in a community and they sort of do know what is going on in the community. But the price of this is, of course, also they have the interests of the community at heart, which at some, yeah, I don't know, it's, a, it's at a price. I mean, at some point the party wants to have, know what's going on and what the interests of the community are as well. But, um, you know, if it comes to a, if there's a conflict of interest, that's an interesting choice for party members to make. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, so my, uh, I know this talk is more about a kind of a economic decision, but I have a question kind of uh, on the anti-corruption part mm -hmm. a little bit, yeah. I'll start with, uh, kind of a folk belief uh, that I collect from my field work. That is, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you have two lives if you are party members. Yeah. So basically seeing that, uh, okay, if there is something like a criminal charge or even anti-corruption one, uh, if you belong to the party, well, uh, kind of before the kind of a legal sentence, I mean, you will have some internal parchment, but that will save you. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, we know the anti-corruption is quite harsh, so probably there would be some kind of counter effect if you are part of the party member. But that kind of folk logic is really any good many people's decision to join the party or have some affinity with the party in the first place. So I'm just curious, for these people in the company, of course, I mean, there are different ways, I mean, to build a network, uh, but how about from their own perspective? Yeah, there is something like uh, they just think, oh, I shall have some affinity with the party in order to save me or give me some kind of uh, the safeguard in the future. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's work done, of course, on the inner party investigation, and it does not look like a very comfortable system if you're investigated by the party. I'm not sure that this is something that you... 
uh, what, what that you would prefer over a normal criminal investigation. So uh, kind of the prior of the, I have some questions about, about that, especially under Xi Jinping, whether having this party procedure is something that you would prefer over a criminal procedure. I would say no. Um, but I think uh, more broadly the question on joining the party to avoid uh, or uh, like the trade-offs that you have in mind when joining the party. I mean, one thing is, if you want a management position, if you're any, if you're ambitious, I mean, nowadays, if you really want to rise up to the top of a company or even into the personnel department, probably having a party membership is really useful to get promoted. I mean, you kind of need it um, because now it's like um, the goal is to have many party members in certain leading sectors of the bank, including the personnel department. If you want to get there, you need a party membership. I think that would be th sort of the trade-off that comes to mind first, um, rather than the, I, I'm skeptical. Thank you very much for the great talk. We're all done, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and great questions. Yeah.